And it's another Divorce TV show. Thank you for joining us. Um, remember, you can make comments at any point during the show. And we have today an expert interview with Sebastian, who coaches parents parents of teenage children. Uh, any of you who have or had teenage children, you'll know that that is quite a specialised area. So, um, And Sebastian can give us some great advice particularly if we're going through a divorce or co-parenting situation, how we deal with our teenage kids. We're going to have a shared story from Varsha, who is a divorce coach, but she has her own experiences and story to share with us. And we will end with a healing from Shandon. But right now, we're going to have a look at the news. Right, first story today is from The Mirror. And this is, uh, this is a, I'm going to have another look at uh, Married at First Sight. Uh, I, I asked the question the other week whether, you know, how do they deal with the common issue of divorce? Uh, and they have really thought it all through. So it says, while the show is all about finding true love, Married at First Sight bosses are aware that things can easily go downhill. Therefore, they make sure the couples sign a brief prenup so that if they split, they don't lose anything very sensible. So Chris Colan, who is executive, executive sorry, producer on the American version of the show, told The Wrap, there is a prenup that is built in. It's a very short, brief prenup. It basically says what they walk into with the marriage is what they walk out the marriage with. We want to give them some protection walking in. If for some reason it does not work out, at least you're protected with this basic form. You're not going to get yourself into any legal trouble. Once they're, up, once they're in the marriage, everything is completely up to them. The divorce process is made very easy for the, they refer to as the doomed couples, but there is a catch. Now, in the UK version of the show, they ha you have to stay together for a whole year before you can apply to get divorced. Obviously, you don't actually have to be living together, but you can't apply for the divorce for, um, until you've been married for a year. Bosses make sure that, that there is money put aside to cover legal costs within a certain period of time, obviously. So uh, there sounds like they've got it all very well sorted. In fact, there might be some who might say that everyone who gets married should, uh, perhaps they should, we should all put a little fund aside as a kind of insurance policy. Next one is we're going to have a little look at An Angelina again. And Brad, what are they up to uh, again? Their, their, their saga, well, I believe their four-year divorce battle has been uh, going on pretty much longer than their actual marriage. And this, they've hit a new speed bump, it says. Again, this is in the Mail Online. And what they're saying is that um, the actress parts ways with another high-priced attorney and refuses to agree to Pitt's request for 50-50 custody of their kids. Angelina Jolie's bitter divorce battle with Brad Pitt has hit yet another bump in the road after the actress parted ways with one of her high-priced attorneys. Priya Sapari, Sapori, sorry, a Los Angeles-based former federal prosecutor who has been working with Jolie's lead lawyer, Samantha Dejeune, is out after filing a notice of withdrawal of attorney of record with LA Superior Court, DailyMail.com has learnt. Now, it's not clear whether Jolie, who is fighting Pitt's efforts to win 50-50 custody of their children, fired Sapori or if the attorney made the decision to quit. Now, in 2018, superstar LA divorce attorney Laura Vassa, whose client list reads like a who's who of Hollywood, stopped working for Jolie when the actress's legal fight with Pitt, 56, reportedly became too venomous and nasty. Uh, it's pretty bad when, you're, um, when your lawyer says it's too nasty and they leave. Um, it was thought at the time that Jolie's hard-nosed attitudes towards Pitt was not a good fit with Vassa's more gentle conciliatory, conciliatory approach. A big factor in the couple's battle is Jolie's desire to move the children abroad. Pitt is vehemently opposed to her moving them to a foreign country. 
which is understandable. In June last year, Pitt, who admitted being an alcoholic at the time of their split, but is now recovered, secured a legal breakthrough when a judge ruled he would be permitted more time with the children. He is believed to see them every few days. Um, I know that he's not the only person um, in America or the UK who is, you know, would be horrified if the children got moved away because of a divorce. That is something that causes, uh, I'm sure some of you have had to or are dealing with at the moment. And our final story of today is we are going to have a little look at a slightly lighter story about Drew Barrymore. That's in the Mail Online. Drew Barrymore, Barrymore admits she did not take her 2016 divorce from Will Copelman well. Quote, I took it really hard. Now, I know from not growing up with any family whatsoever, she says, that that was the last thing I wanted to do for my daughters. Copelman and Barrymore ultimately decided to split in 2016 after four years of marriage together. The two announced the news with a joint statement, but also shared that they were trying to emphasise family throughout the process. Sadly, our family is separating legally, although we do not feel this takes away from us being a family, the couple had said. They continued, divorce might make one feel like a failure, but eventually you start to find grace in the idea that life goes on. Our children are our universe and we look forward to living the rest of our lives with them as the first priority. The couple still maintains it to co-parent their two girls, Olive 8 and Frankie 6 in New York City. And what I really like about that story is it, they had an amicable divorce, but it's still tough. Um, but the focus is remaining on the children. So it's good to have some positive uh, role models out there in um, in the world of celebrity. Now we're going to prepare for our expert interview. And welcome, welcome, Sebastian. Sebastian. Hello, everyone. It's very nice to be here. Thank you for the invitation, Susie. Great to see you. Great and, to see you. And uh, getting getting a bit of getting, feedback. Getting have you got feedback. me coming have through you your computer? Oh, you using? I'm. I'm. Can you hear me doubling up? No, I can hear, me, can you hear me doubling up. Oh, so no, just I can hear you very well now. Brilliant. 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 So, so my first question my then first is question is. What, what does well, it really mean to be, really mean to be a coach for, a coach for uh, the uh, parents, the of, teenagers? parents of teenagers? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much. Very good question. Um, it's really interesting. I spoke, uh, I'm in constant touch with uh, many parental coaches and with many parents. And what we have noticed that there's um, pretty much a lot going for for parents of younger children but the older your child is, there's the less things are going on. I don't know why. And maybe because, maybe because uh, having teenagers at home is a very, usually a very difficult, very challenging time. Doesn't matter whether you are divorced or not. Uh, some parents, some of my clients, they uh, say that it's better to be a single parent when you've got teenagers because then you don't need to uh, agree on everything with your with your spouse. I don't know different people, different stories, obviously. But now, what does it mean to be um, uh, to be a coach for parents of teens? Basically, it means that uh, I believe that what's very important for us parents, especially parents of teenagers, is harmony. And harmony for me is a synonym of, of, of a few words. For example, inner peace calm um, and certainty and self-confidence and when we have uh, teenagers um, they may trigger loads of challenges in our life so on top of other things for example nowadays you've got pandemic uh, you can be divorcing you may be losing your job you can be maybe losing your income and then on top of it you've got your teenage child at home and you will find that very often they are not helping the situation that they are kindling even more uh, storm at home more arguments at home so now how to bring harmony into your life i do believe that there are two ways one way is you can create harmony you can look for the harmony and peace in you, yourself but then 
but also there are situations like pandemic, this times of uncertainty, getting a divorce, splitting with your partner, that you what you really need, you need more peace and harmony and certainty given to you from other people. Yes, from friends, but also from experts like myself, like yourself, Susie. Um, and um, and this is this is the time where you really need to look for other people to help you out to find this harmony and inner peace. Um, how can you do it? I believe that there are three steps towards this. One step, step number one is to understand. Understand why your teenage child is behaving the way he she is behaving, because there's lots of changes going on in the your child's brain. But also you have to understand yourself, your situation, your, why you are responding to some of your child's behavior the way you're responding. Why are you taking this so personally? So it's very important to uh, explore. Second step is connecting, connecting with your child, but also, first of all, connecting with yourself to build relation, relationships with yourself and then with your child. It includes lots of communication techniques and strategies. And the third final, uh, final um, step is change. Um, years ago, nearly 20 years ago, when I was uh, training to become a teacher, I was taught that uh, a person needs usually 21 days to change behavior. One of the uh, most recent researches proved that uh, on average, we need 66 days to change a simple, a small habit or to replace it with a new habit. And um, so I believe that parenting, especially parenting of teenagers, this is making these small changes, small steps every day if possible. So do not expect you know, huge changes overnight. Have you got, um, you got uh, 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 an example of something that a typical parent a typical with teenage, parent with teenage kids, kids would find would worthwhile find practicing. practicing. Uh, yes, I've got a few a few techniques and uh, a little bit of disclaimer first. Um, techniques, uh, the technique I'm going to uh, tell you about in a second, usually it works really well immediately you apply it, but it has it has to be applied in a correct way. But then, uh, but also you can see that this technique on the other hand side also needs embedding into your into your family, into your relationship with your with your child. So one technique I would like to tell you about, um, I would like all of our listeners and also uh, you, Susie, to imagine situation that you are a child, you are, you are a girl and I'm your parent and you are coming back from school and uh, with um, with a note from the teacher that oh, nowadays you would get it, you know, by a text message or an email that you haven't done your work, homework. Okay? And the way I can react, way number one, I can react this way. Susie, for goodness sake, you haven't done your homework again. You never do your homework. How would you feel? Bad. Bad. Angry. Angry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, the second way I can respond to you, I can just read the text message from, my, from your school and just ignore it. And you may think, wow, my dad has ignored it. So, OK, I'm not going to do uh, the homework again. Really interestingly enough, uh, one of my business partners, I spoke with her today and she told me that she had she used to, she was an extremely good student, but she was not doing this. She was not studying. She's not that good student only because she wanted to be, but she was afraid of her parents. So now in the second situation, when I'm uh, so, but not everyone is like that. Many children would say, OK, whatever. My dad, my mom don't uh, care about it. So I won't do my homework. So obviously the second, the first response was like a fight response. Yes, I wanted to fight with you, not physically, but verbally. Susie, how dare you? Second response was freeze or flight. Yes, I would. OK, whatever. I ignore the response. And we human beings, we are very strange creatures because fight and flight response come immediately to our minds. But actually, the better, more human response would be 
uh, such a spot, like for example, oh, Susie, today I have received a text message from school and uh, I'm worried that you haven't done this homework. Uh, how can I help you? How would you feel, Susie, if I ask you very, this way? Very different. Very different. It's mm -hmm. very, very different. Very, very different. Uh, yes, and this is the, which response would you like to get from me? One, two or three? Definitely number Definitely three. Definitely number three. Mm -hmm. And this is I message. Yes, when I communicate to my child in a very assertive way uh, about my feelings. Yes, for example, I feel worried. Then I provide a fact. Why am I feeling worried? So here we have to avoid these words like, you always don't do it. Yeah, but no particular fact you haven't done this particular homework and i'm worried and then you can provide help for example how can i help you it's a very good opener for discussions or even if a child does not respond to it immediately keep telling this keep practicing because then the child will notice wow my mom my dad they really love me and they do show this love to me they really want to help me they are not here to punish me they are here to help me, to guide me. So this is one technique I do always recommend my parents, my clients to start the journey with. That's a brilliant one. That's and, a brilliant of course, one. and of course, if your child's not, used, your child's to not it, used to it, there will be a transition, will be a won't, transition there. won't there? Yes, that's true. But also it's really interesting that also we parents are not used to this. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, talking about general, in general terms with parents, but many parents do not find it difficult to use it. I, okay, I may say, okay, I'm well trained. I have been teacher for such a long time. I do coaching for parents, but I'm only a human being. And now and then I snap, I say something to my children. I've got two of them at home, not one. My daughter has just moved away to, because she started her uni, but, um, but then I think, goodness me, this is not the way I wanted to say, yes? And and this is okay because it's also to show children that we are only humans and we can say, okay, I'm sorry, love, that I responded in this way yesterday. And then you can make, mm. um, you can uh, then use the I message. That's brilliant, that's brilliant. That's brilliant, and, that's brilliant. And, um, and when I, and I, when I'll I, take you I, in, on the, show. in on the show, once it's live Once everywhere, it's live everywhere it'd, be great if you it'd be great if you can share some links some to links some to other other ways, other, that, you other can ways that you can support us. Yes, of course, there are two, uh, many ways I can support, but there are two ways I would like to today to, um, to tell you about. One is uh, for any listeners, for the first 10 listeners of uh, who will come to me, I'm very happy to provide um, a free 30 minute session, 30 minutes or longer session, and see how I can help you. And the second thing, I would like to provide a huge discount for my online course, which is worth 124 uh, pounds, but I would like to divide it by 10 and give a discount of 12.4 pounds for this <laughs> online course. That's brilliant. Thank That's you. Brilliant. And so Thank everyone you. watching, so you'll, 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 I will make sure that you add your sure links to your, the, the, the different posts the on the different, different posts platforms. platforms. Thank, you, yes, so much, Thank you so much, Sebastian. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, I'm taking on board all of that. I've, I've still got one uh, one who, he's not, I don't know if he's quite a teenager, but he's still still at home and uh, and we all need lots of practice as parents, as we all know. Right, I'm just gonna pop through the short masterclass here, do a little bit of learning, and then we will move on to our shared story. So today I wanted so to, today I wanted to um, um, talk, about talk about the financial the planners. Financial planners. Now I'm, now going, I'm to going to just Keep this brief. I'm getting a little bit of feedback here, which I hope you're not getting. Ah, uh, here we are. No, it seems to have gone now. I love technology. So we're still on intelligence um, on the sort of set sail part of the divorce masterclass. Financial planners and part of intelligence, obviously, as we've talked in previous shows, is about 
getting to know what everybody does and how to use them appropriately because that can save you a lot of time and a lot of money and also a lot of stress. So just to be sure, I know some of you will already have a good idea about financial planners. I've had a few on the show already, but we can never, uh, just wanted to add a little bit more detail about them. So lawyers are not always the, the experts that you need when it comes to finance. Um, when you have something like pensions to split or properties or businesses to divide, then financial planners are really usually the experts that you really need to talk to because that's their thing. So financial planners are also known as wealth managers and they're not the same as your regular independent financial advisors like IFAs. They specialised uh, they specialised in helping you plan the long term future for your whole family after the split, but also if you work with those who specialise, because not all of them do in the early stages, they can also help you um, work out how to split, uh, what's the fairest way by making sure that you're looking long term. And they, they can certainly also help you uh, dealing with complex pension splitting and the division of properties. So if you want to work out a fair way to split the finances, why would you not talk to an expert in the field? Uh, lawyers may specialise in financial matters, but they don't spend years training in long-term cash flow forecasting, which is the thing you want, and pensions as well at the level that someone like uh, Henry Elliston or Christina Rogers, uh, both of them are part of the uh, Best Way to Divorce team of experts. Both of them are chartered, which uh, puts them into a whole higher bracket of, of experience. And they both also specialise in this area, which not all financial planners do. So when you're divorcing, make sure that you talk to the right people at the right time. And if that is uh, anything to do with finances, don't just leave it all to your lawyer. Make sure you talk to a financial planner who does long term cash flow forecasting and also is you know, has experience in helping people with the divorce in the divorce area. So for we're now moving to one of my favourite parts. I love the share stories and we are going to be talking to Varsha. Right, I'm just trying to bring Varsha in here. Yep, we have sound. Welcome Varsha, thank you for being on the show. Uh, thank you for having me here, Susie. It's uh, great to have this opportunity. And you're a divorce and welfare coach, but you have your own story as well, your own experience, don't you? Absolutely. I am a divorce coach because of my story. So will you, you can't share that with us? Because it was a bit dramatic, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. So if I can share my story a little bit with yourself. Um, I've got two children, one with mental health problems and one with a lifelong medical problem. And I was married to an alcoholic. Uh, so when I, I wanted to go for my divorce, we've tried the rehabs and everything for my husband. Uh, when I wanted to go for the divorce, I was not even working at that stage. So all the overwhelm of thinking, how am I going to manage financially? Uh, am I going to have a house to live in with the kids? I think we all go through that, but for a person who's not working, uh, that is even uh, a bigger worry than anybody else who is working. Um, so, but I, I was starting to go downhill so quickly and getting depressed and I thought, even whatever happens, it doesn't matter. I just need to get out of this space and then I'll deal with the finances of whatever comes later. I need to get out of this space. Um, so I started working for a charity and they sort of gave me a solicitor uh, who could help me. Uh, I'd also gone to Gingerbread Men and at that time they said, you're not physically abused, so we cannot help you. So the financial, mental and emotional abuse at that time in 2013 was not recognized at that time. Uh, I also went to a community center and because I was not working, uh, they told me we cannot help you because you're not the one bringing the pay slip uh, at home. So obviously you are not paying the mortgage. Uh, although I was having disability living allowance and carer's allowance. So it was a very uh, dark place I was in um, and it was very traumatic at that time. So when the charity sort of gave me a solicitor, we started working together, started creating the for me, the financial forms. And just two weeks before my first court hearing, they emailed me and they said they've moved to Manchester and they can no longer represent me. 
I mean, that is the final straw anybody can go through and think, they, what, what can I do? You know, because what do you do from there? Because I thought I need a solicitor. And we all think we need a solicitor. But I've learned the hard way that really speaking, sometimes you don't need solicitors and you can do a lot of work yourself. Um, so my journey has taught me a lot of things and I think it happened in my life for a reason. So they moved away and they, two days before my court hearing, uh, they rung me, talked me through all my paperwork and I went to court alone without a solicitor for my first hearing. It was quite traumatic. It was quite emotional because my ex had written a statement uh, with a lot of lies in it. So not only was I going along without a solicitor, but I had to face all that. Anyway, eventually I went five times to court alone. And the final time I took a direct access barrister. I had never heard of a direct access barrister, but my journey taught me a lot of things that if you want to save money, you can either have somebody like me, a divorce coach, who can support you and help you through all the financial matters to look through all that, the parental planning, uh, managing your emotions, dialing them down, and you'll be saving a lot of money because uh, obviously you're not going to be told put 10,000 at the table first and then we can start whatever we need to. So I went through my divorce alone. I created my legal bundle myself. I know what a legal bundle is. I know how to index it. And because I'm a management accountant, uh, I help my clients uh, to look at the financial figures and roughly tell them where maybe a split can happen. And then obviously um, they can do whatever they need to do if they're going to the solicitor or whatnot. I have the right sort of people in, in my team as well, if they need financial advice or financial planning, or they need a mortgage advisor or a solicitor or whatever they need, then I can guide them to the right people. But I sort of do quite a lot of work with them. Uh, How so did your story my, end? How did your personal story end? My story ended that I, I got more than what I expected and I have my own house now, I got a split of the pension, and I'm a divorce coach now because of that. And would you say, just to round off, was that because you, uh, uh, because you took the time and trouble to, to not be afraid of the financials, but from, with your financial own um, financial knowledge, and you just had the courage to go and do it properly, you didn't just hand over all your power to solicitors and... Um, partly because you, you you didn't have that choice, I guess, at that point. But you re, you took very much took responsibility for the process and you managed it really well yourself. I am so proud of myself that at that time I, I was lumbered into it, but I took the responsibility. I had to do it. I didn't have a choice. But you're right. The power didn't go to the solicitors and I could do things uh, quite myself. And the direct access barrister helped me to see that I deserve more than what I, I thought I was going to get. So brilliant. obviously brilliant. it ended very nicely for me. That's brilliant. Thank oh, you so brilliant. much, Varsha, and thank, uh, you. thank you for sharing your story. No, thank you very much. So, uh, uh, it's so you know, sometimes you do have to end up in court because the, the other person um, makes that necessary, which is always a shame, but you don't always have to spend thousands and thousands to do it you can do it and you can get some support to, to help you to do it yourself um but it does take courage which is why you need help and support just doing a very quick roundup now a couple of useful qr codes for you to get your phones ready and then we will have our healing to end uh, here we are the divorce financial workshop and that is uh, coming up in January and that link will take you through to where you need to be for that. And uh, yeah, that's gonna be where we have not just family lawyers and wills and trusts, we've got immigration lawyer joining us, plus the, the, the uh, divorce, best way to divorce uh, squad as well. And just wanted to pop this one in again, our family wizard, wonderful resource for co-parenting, really helps set boundaries, online calendar and other goodies there as well. So let's get ready now for our healing. And I would like to welcome, um, uh, we've got Shandan Kuna here, who's going to do a lovely meditation with us. Perhaps you can give us a little idea, Shandan, of, of what's coming up. 
Hi, um, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me, first of all. Uh, so we're going to be doing a little meditation on cultivating and building up a kind of a safety net around ourselves. Yeah? So I think that is the first thing which we need when we are going through a kind of an emotional battle within ourselves and of course everybody everywhere around us when we are going through divorce. And, uh, and give yourself this gift of 10 minutes maybe every day to kind of build up that safety net so that you can feel secure within yourself and then you can go and uh, fight the battle outside yeah so it's more of the battle inside which you have to be in peace with like you have said make peace your weapon isn't it so you have to make that choice to have that cultivate that peace within build that safety net within create that safe space and then go out yeah so and the procedure of the meditation will be so we'll use a little bit of uh, visualization. So we'll close our eyes and then we'll uh, calm our body down. Yeah. So then we will focus over here in the middle of the brain. So that is where the screen of the mind is. Yeah. So that's where we run all the thoughts and we will use our breath to uh, calm our thoughts. Yeah. And then we'll create a kind of a safety net around ourselves. Yeah, so that will be the procedure which we will be doing during the meditation. That's lovely. And we're going to move into, I'm going to go to uh, putting a little bit of gentle music on behind us. And then uh, when we've ended, um, we'll, I'll round off the show and we'll be able to, um, if you can pop in some information and links to to the show online on Facebook and LinkedIn, I'll tag you into where all the places it is so people can find out more. Thank you so much okay. uh, for, for coming, you. especially at such thank short you. notice, Shandon. Yeah, thank you. So we're going to be just sitting, making sure our back is straight. And you can close your eyes and making sure your feet and your hands are not touching each other and your feet are properly placed on the ground. You're just going to close your eyes and connect yourself to your breathing. This is the way to go within. So when you start to observe yourself and you observe your breath, you start to disconnect from everything outside. So you're just observing your breath, how the breath is going in and out. You're not disrupting your breathing, you're not trying to breathe in harder, but you're just trying to observe your breath. As you try to observe your breath, your nervous system starts to ease up. Now you're going to use your breath to relax your body. So you're going to breathe in to your chest and you're going to expand your chest. And as you're going to breathe out, you're going to relax your chest and your shoulders. With the next breath, you're going to breathe into your stomach and you're going to expand your stomach. And as you're going to breathe out, you're going to relax your stomach, your chest and your shoulders. Next breath, you're going to breathe in. And as you're going to breathe out, you're going to bring your awareness to your hips and allow your hips to relax and sink a little bit deeper wherever you are sitting. With the next breath, you're going to relax your thighs and your knees. With 
with the next breath you're going to relax your legs your calves your shin your ankles and your feet so your whole body below your neck should be completely relaxed Now we're going to bring our awareness to our head and our face. Breathe in deeply and as you're going to breathe out, you're going to relax your skull, the back of your skull, the top of your skull and the front of your skull. Use the next breath to relax your facial muscles, your jaw, your eyes your ears and allow yourself to completely relax so scan your body from the top of your head to the tip of your toes Every cell of your body should be completely relaxed. Next step, we're going to relax our mind. We're going to focus our attention to the center of the forehead between our eyebrows. This is where the screen of the mind is. This is where we constantly keep running the thoughts. Thoughts about the past, thoughts about the future. As we start to observe the thoughts, they start to lose their grip on your mind. And use your breath to relax your mind. As your mind starts to relax and create a space, you create a space in your mind. This is what peace is. When you create that space in between your thoughts. Now, you're going to visualize yourself in this red color capsule. So you're sitting in that capsule. Feel the warmth of that red color light all around you. This is your safety net. Feel yourself safe in there. Bring yourself back to your home. Back to yourself. This is where all the healing takes place. Allow every cell of your body to vibrate with that red color light. So your whole of your face, your neck, your chest, your stomach, your legs and your feet. The whole of your body is enveloped in the warmth of that safety red color light. Feel the warmth. Breathe in that feeling of safety and breathe out that feeling of safety. And say to yourself, I am safe. I am loved. And I am always connected to the ground below me and the heavens above. 
and feel that connection, feel that safety. Then bring yourself back, having rejoiced in that safety. I'm going to count from one to five. One, two, three, four, and five. Bring yourself back. Hearing all the sounds around in the room. Be more aware of where you are sitting. Breathe in deeply and breathe out. Bring your hands together, wrap your hands and go over your eyes. Bring yourself back to the prayer position and being grateful for your experience. Thank you. Oh, thank you very, very, very much, Shandon. That was absolutely delightful. And I shall be replaying that later until I can do it again. Um, so in that calm, calm way, on the battlefield of family separation and in the war of divorce, always make sure that peace is your weapon of choice. <laughs>